Um, welcome from Nitte Deem to be University in Mangaluru. Today, we live in a world where Facebook alone has 1.6 billion active monthly users. A decade ago, social media seemed to be so much simpler. There were no sponsored ads, virtually no one was a social media influencer, photo editing was best left to the professionals, and live streaming on the apps wasn't a thing. Over the last 10 years, social media has largely evolved from keeping in touch with others to flaunting what we have for attention or curating unrecognizable versions of our real selves. We went from draining our data plans digitally, uh, we went from draining our data plans digitally to poking uh, digitally people on Facebook to being constantly immersed in a sea of memes. Social media's influence has undermined political elections. It has also raised questions concerning privacy and credibility of news. So with this background, I welcome each one of you to national webinar on harnessing social media for professional growth. Today, we try and understand how social media platforms can be used for professional and institutional growth. I take this opportunity to welcome our distinguished speakers and panelists. Dr. Smita Rangnathan, faculty member, Digital Strategy and Contemporary Marketing, SPGA School of Management. We welcome you, ma'am. Mr. Neelashish Basu, Search Ads 360 Specialist from Google. Welcome, Neelashish. And Mr. Nikesh Ghosh, who's a co-founder of Chartveda. It's a chart marketing agency. Welcome, Neelashish. I also take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Harsha Halhali, Director of Curriculum Development, Nitte Deem to be University, and Ms. Sadhana Deshmukh, Director of Faculty Development, and Nitte Deem to be University. May I request uh, Dr. Harsha to give his opening remarks, please? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Aviraj. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all uh, on behalf of uh, Nitte Deem to be University as well as uh, Nitte Institute of uh, Communication. Um, uh, welcome to all the delegates. Uh, welcome to our resource persons uh, for the day, um, Dr. S uh, Smita Ranganathan, uh, Mr. Nilashis Basu, and Mr. Nikesh Ghosh. Uh, we are delighted to have you with uh, uh, have you with us uh, here today. Uh, I understand um, uh, from Mrs. Sadhana, who is all, uh, who is you know um, played a played an important role in organizing this, that we have a large number of delegates who have um, uh, registered themselves for, uh, for this. And we have people from varied backgrounds and uh, varied levels of experience that always uh, you know, makes for a good uh, uh, webinar uh, because uh, um, uh, it, it makes it challenging for resource persons to uh, address the requirements of such a varied crowd. At the same time, uh, the, 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 the interaction between people from varied backgrounds also contributes to the, uh, uh, the outcomes of the webinar. Um, uh, I'm, I, 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 I appreciate and congratulate uh, the uh, our communications uh, institute, uh, NICOD, as we call it internally, um, uh, for um, coming up with this theme for this webinar and for uh, taking the lead in organizing this. Uh, you know, as Nitte deemed to be university, uh, uh, we are a relatively young university, about uh, a dozen years now, about 12 years now. Um, we started out as primarily a health sciences major uh, university. And we are particularly excited to have programs in uh, communication, journalism, and uh, uh, you know programs like uh, architecture, which have been added in the last uh, three to four years. Uh, it excites us because this brings uh, greater diversity into our program offerings. It brings in diversity in terms of uh, you know the, the the students that we have, and of course um, uh, um, um, uh, venturing into uh, humanities and. Uh, 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 design and aesthetics. Uh, this brings in a whole lot of value to our existing community of students and faculty. It broadens our horizons. It brings in different perspectives, and infuses that uh, uh, um, that element of creativity, which otherwise, you know, the the, the pure technical professional courses that that we have uh, sometimes kind of suffer a lack of. Um, and uh, Nico, in particular, uh, has been uh, a great contributor. Uh, you know, as a university. Uh, within this short time, uh, we are consistently ranked within the top 70, 80 uh, in, in the NIRF rankings in India. Uh, we are also figuring in the top 500 uh, in, in, in Asia in the QS uh, uh, rankings. Um, um, so uh, um, um, uh, institutions like NICO, the young and dynamic institutions like NICO, 
have been contributing to this and they have been actively helping us in 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 media management and you know in 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 our, in our uh, projection of the university uh, externally too because of their inherent uh, uh, competencies so it's uh, great to see uh, nico coming up with uh, this kind of programs uh, and uh, in the coming days uh, you know if one looks at the uh, uh, national education policy uh, there's a clear mandate for uh, becoming multidisciplinary and uh, uh, i'm sure that uh, uh, you know nico and uh, uh, similar uh, uh, you know uh, uh, colleagues in nico will 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 be of great value to the university in uh, leading us from a relatively uh, focused university to a more a broader uh, multidisciplinary university. Um, so um, uh, I am by, by training I'm a doctor and uh, you know I'm, I majored in uh, neurophysiology. So my 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 primary interest in interest is in neuroscience. So I I probably have uh, a, a little more than the uh, you know normal interest and. In, uh, uh, awareness of psychology and it's from that perspective that you know um, uh, my interest in social media uh, continues to grow uh, i must admit that i'm not a real social media enthusiast i'm a kind of a reluctant uh, social media participant uh, um, my first experience experience with social media really was probably with orkut i don't know uh, how many of how many of us still remember that uh, 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 but uh, over the years, I have followed it from a slightly academic perspective. So I would just like to spend maybe five minutes, with your permission, to just uh, you know uh, uh, share uh, what I think is a value of this kind of a webinar. Of this kind of a webinar. Uh, right. Um, I have been following some literature, uh, um, uh, you know, about uh, uh, social media, and there are some things which are emerging in the last few years that fascinates me from uh, from understanding the motivations as to why people, uh, you know, use social media and how it uh, has impact for their, um, you know, social life as well as uh, health, both 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 physical health and mental health. So. Um, um, Social uh, networking. Um, there are three key elements that uh, one can identify in social networking. You know, it's a virtual space that is populated by uh, digital uh, personas, uh, uh, and so each one of us who participates in this kind of a social network, uh, we become part of that network. Uh, we have connections with others in the network, and uh, uh, some of these connections are real in the sense that uh, they are with people we really know in 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 you know in in, in face to face interactions, and there are some which are virtual whom we have never probably met physically, but we have connections. Some of these connections are strong, you know, they we are closely connected. Some of them are weak, and um, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, different about uh, digital social networks versus our traditional face to face networks is that. Uh, others uh, networks are also visible to us in a more explicit manner you don't have to ask someone to know if they know someone else uh, it uh, uh, often is fully or partially visible to us uh, 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 through the uh, through the platforms so these three elements of 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 a social network uh, digital social network uh, provides opportunities for two things one is managing the social network and the second thing is managing our social Personas, our social identities. Uh, I think these are the two uh, kind of uh, core things that uh, we do when we engage in 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 in, in social media. And um, uh, you know, uh, some of these scholars uh, in, in in this area have uh, termed this uh, social space, uh, social digital space, as the space of interreality, where there is a where there is a kind of a um, you know mixture of uh, the real uh, relationships, the real connections, and the virtual connections. And at some points of time, the the boundary between these two begins to blur. Um, um, so there are uh, there are three kind of um, uh, 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 three uh, uh, advantages which could also be looked at as you know uh, disadvantages of uh, social networking that, that people like me would probably face. One thing is that social social media is very amenable for impression management. I know most of us. Uh, invariably, do wear some kind of a mask. The mask may be a really obvious one or a very subtle one. Um, uh, sometimes it is. Uh, sometimes it's very well hidden. But still, the fact is that we are all kind of you know creating the trying to create an impression that in the way that we would like to be perceived to be. So this impression management um, 
does not always work in the sense that um, uh, the way our imp the, the, the impressions that we create, the way they are perceived, uh, could be uh, is not completely in our hands. And you know, by being tagged or by being commented upon, uh, the, the impression that we are trying to create uh, is altered. It is perceived very differently uh, by, by by those whom we want to uh, possibly impress. And therefore, there is this uh, the, the same things that make impression management possible. The same tool also uh, make it sometimes difficult to manage repetitions online. And uh, this is something uh, that I think uh, is uh, many of us uh, are rather naive about and uh, we need to be aware about. Uh, a similar kind of a, a, a duality exists in terms of you know, our attempts for personal branding. Uh, we, want to we, we often create different profiles in different platforms with different objectives, you know, professional objectives, uh, social objectives, um, other objectives. Uh, so when we create these uh, different profiles, we would uh, we would want to we would wish that these these are kind of uh, uh, isolated, but in reality they are not. And anybody can, with a little bit of work, uh, look at your different uh, personas, and uh, you know, uh, and and therefore there is there, 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 there's, there's, there's this give and take between your branding efforts and your privacy uh, concerns. Uh, and this is again something that um, uh, I, I feel that we often don't realize uh, well enough uh, to be uh, to be. To handle these things safely, and there's also this kind of you know conflation between the 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 um, uh, relatively poorly known people on online and the uh, uh, the people that we know very well. You know the the, the spectrum between uh, I, I barely know you to, towards a very very close friend, and we have uh, relationships with uh, across the spectrum. Uh, we have weak points and strong points, and uh, it's very easy in 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 in, in online environments to. Uh, lose that uh, perspective, you know, uh, uh, real interactions provide us very strong cues to our social roles, which are not often available in online interactions. And that disappearance of the division of social roles often leads to conflations of strong and weak connections. And we often see and do things uh, which uh, may be aimed at people we know well, but uh, we, we need to realize that people whom we don't know all that well are also audiences for this and that could have reper repercussions and therefore i think uh, uh, this webinar is very uh, very timely and very useful uh, because uh, we need to create better understanding of uh, what we are dealing with in social media uh, we need to be uh, uh, um, uh, cautious about how to deal with uh, how to interact on, on on social platforms and we need to find this balance between impression management and the reputation hazard that it comes along with the personal branding versus privacy management and of course, uh, the role of uh, doing the right things in the right place and trying to keep them separately, uh, even in uh, online networks. So I think, uh, to, to me, to keep it simple, I, I would like to think that we need to uh, remember that we need to be, as far as possible, be true to us uh, ourselves, even on uh, even in online interactions, and be grounded. I think uh, this is uh, something which uh, uh, lies at the uh, core of uh, safety on online interactions and uh, improving the effectiveness. We have, of course, we started using social media often for purely social reasons, uh, for personal reasons. But inevitably, we uh, we are moving towards greater use for professional use, and uh, we should. Uh, that is one of the great advantages, uh, potentials that we need to tap into. But uh, uh, we need to uh, be aware of these issues uh, when we when we do that. So, um, um, digital literacy, specifically social media literacy, is required both for digital immigrants like me who had not uh, seen a computer till I was around 30, as well as for uh, digital natives uh, who are you know, born into technology. But uh, a recent study, I'm sure all of you, uh, the resource persons will be aware in 2018, uh, which, uh, you know, which, which, which seems to suggest that digital natives are not necessarily digitally literate. So I, I think this webinar would go uh, a long way in uh, helping us uh, with these issues. Um, um, uh, I would like to. Um, uh, uh, end this uh, short introduction, uh, this opening remarks, by once again uh, welcoming all of you, and particularly the resource persons. I'm sure this is going to be an exciting uh, uh, half a day ahead of us. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here, Dr. Ravidaj. Uh, uh, wish you all the best for this seminar. Thank you, Dr. Harsha, for those wonderful words. Uh, now, may I request uh, Dr. Smita uh, to present a topic. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Aviraj. Uh, 
Dr. Harsha, I so connect with your uh, closing remarks, which is about uh, social media or an online identity is more about being true to yourself. Uh, it can't be better said than that. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment to share my uh, screen. All right, good morning, all of you. Uh, I'm just hoping that uh, you're able to see the screen coming through. Yes, yes. All right, super. All right, so, uh, you know, it's a very interesting uh, set of panels, uh, panelists that uh, the team has actually brought in together. Now, as much as, uh, you know, my co panelists would be, uh, you know, very comfortable talking platforms and the digital edge to what we try and achieve online, I decided to keep my, uh, my conversation with you all uh, from a more fundamental point of view, which basically helps us to reflect on why are we looking at, you know, choosing social media for professional development. All right. So my focus over the next 10 minutes of conversation and feel free to, you know, ask me questions about any specific aspect once I, I'm done with uh, my my part of the presentation is, you know, wh what really motivates you to get online with your content and uh, what should we be looking at starting from wherever we are, irrespective of which part of the digital curve that each one of us is looking at. All right. Uh, incidentally, I come from a background in advertising. So I spent about 18 years in pure play advertising when I, and then I realized that, you know, uh, the, the game is really going to be changing and it can no longer be about the way we traditionally sold products. So somewhere in 2012 is when I moved into, you know, trying to get into teaching and I've been uh, uh, more or less a full-time faculty with uh, some of the premier institutes ever since. Now, in 2013, I made an important decision. And the decision was this, that I'm going to be stopping to carry my visiting card. All right. The reason is that is when I was beginning to realize as to nobody is going to keep your visiting card for beyond the first three days of you hand it over to them. And the only true reflection of your identity and your connection is your quotient of discoverability online. So if at all I have a visiting card, perhaps this is how it would look like. Just to give you the context, I teach digital strategy and contemporary marketing with SP Jane. Besides that, I run a couple of my own enterprises, uh, one into uh, the area of uh, handloom textiles, the other one to do with healthcare. And I also function as the honorary marketing advisor on the Ministry of Textiles and the NABAD. All right. That's a bit of what I do besides my interest in mentoring uh, student run organizations. Now that I sort of gave you an illusion of perhaps how my digital visiting card would look, anybody who sort of tries to look for me online and most mostly I find students who are perhaps subscribing for my course trying to understand the context before they decide to subscribe to my course. So my social identities are pretty out there for people to see and uh, there's nothing hidden out there. All right. Uh, maybe I made a personal choice to lock my profile on uh, uh, Facebook, but otherwise it's very, very simple to connect and find me online. And that is an identity uh, that I have kept intentionally to make sure that people can reach out to me effortlessly. All right. So now moving on to the context of what we want to discuss. All right. Now, when the team got back to me saying, you know, we want to look at how do we use social media for professional development? I spent some time to really reflect on what does development as a concept mean to me in today's context. All right. Now, I tried to look at a paradigm shift in the way I interpret the word, uh, you know, professional development. Maybe about a decade ago, all right, professional development is perhaps used to be perhaps akin to learning. And what used to be the markers of learning? Certifications and qualifications that I managed to, you know, put into my uh, basket. But in today's context, I think professional development is definitely about learning, but is equally about a concept called engagement that we use quite often. Now, in this case, there are two 
aspects that come into the context of professional development. One, which is actively involved in the process of learning, and there are dime a dozen options that are available formally and informally for this. And more importantly, what you also see are the passive learning and development opportunities that are around us, thanks to the digital touch points that we've all been exposed to. So I think in today's talk, I'd like to talk to you guys about how do you achieve the context of engagement, which could involve both, both an active and a passive way to connect with your audience. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions that I've seen as a part of my uh, you know, work life is whenever I say I'm on social media, people believe that it's about being omnipresent across channels. Now, this is something that I'm sure my uh, you know, uh, co-panelist Nikesh and Nilashi would, would sort of strongly agree on. For you to be really doing social media, it is not about making a presence felt on all the various channels. Like what Dr. Harsha said, we all started off with the orchids, with, with scraps and means to find our uh, you know, special someone who was there in class 10. That's how we all got into social media to begin with, right? So it's so important for you to understand what is the context of your engagement that to a very large extent will detail what should be the kind of um, strategy that you need to be following in terms of identifying with a particular social media platform. Moving on, the, as I said, the choice of the platform that you decide to focus on or invest on depends largely on your goal of engagement that you want to achieve. So I'll take a minute to talk to you about what do I mean when I say engagement goals. I've actually tried to bifurcate my goals all right, that, that I could sort of reflect on for two critical kind of stakeholders in a higher ed context. The first set of people, I mean, and, and this is the group that I relate to the most uh, because I belong to the stripe, are faculty members, all right? Many of us look at, you know, social media as a means of engaging with students both on and off the campus. Now, this has been true even in the pre-COVID era, and this becomes all the more important in the post-COVID era as well, all right? So this is something that we've been really looking at. Many of us today are looking at social media as a means to wanting to engage and collaborate with peers. All right. Now, these peers could be our uh, you know, faculty belonging to other institutions who could be cross-domain or could be you know, people belonging to your domain or could also be representatives from the corporate or from the industry so that you can co-create a variety of knowledge outputs. Could be relating to research obviously manifesting itself into publications or finding a way to be part of events. So this is another critical engagement goal that I would be looking at or I have been looking at ever since I got onto the social media bandwagon close to about a decade ago. The other important aspect for you to look at social media are uh, looking at opportunities to connect with subject matter experts to very consciously upskill yourself. And if you're looking at, you know, courses like what some of us teach, uh, things like digital strategy and, you know, marketing management, you find that as much as some of the fundamentals remain the same, you, you sort of change the context changes almost every six months, right? So it's so important for you to stay relevant. And the last but not the least, all of us would like to, you know, relive the context of, you know, nostalgia. So we always like to go back and connect with our old colleagues. And in my case, staying connected with my erstwhile students or, or my erstwhile colleagues is a very strong motivator what takes me to social media. So these could be some of the engagement goals, all right? And it's so important for us to reflect on what it is so that I decide what is the, you know, the typical platform that I go on. From an academic leadership point of view, let's assume that you are part of a corporate relationship team, or if you are part of maybe a, a recruitment team, what I mean is if you're responsible for student recruitment, or if you're responsible for marketing communication for your institute, then obviously some of these goals could you know, sort of be a little altered. So one of the critical aspects for you, your KRAs could be, how can I continue to be a very compelling voice of my institute 
for the external stakeholders. The external stakeholders could be uh, public at large, could be um, very specific governmental bodies, could be to prospective students, could be to parents and caregivers and the other stakeholders who are of interest to you. How can you go back and find ways to you know, connect with prospective students for enrollment? Now, social media is a fantastic uh, platform for you to drive this enthusiasm and interest onto your higher ed brand. Or how do I use the or leverage the power of alumni network so that I have a steady stream of um, high, what we refer to as earned media or goodwill coming up from your alumni network? Most importantly, social media is a fantastic way for me to strongly listen in, listening into what people are talking about. So social media often is considered to be a medium for broadcast. I also want us to appreciate the fact that it's perhaps one of the most important media to get into proactively listen so that you work on what you refer to as online reputation management and also to get on top of a situation, God forbid, if there be a crisis. So all of these become very, very critical goals for us to look at before we get into any engagement process. All right. Based on the above said, and this uh, you know, framework which I tried to put in is heavily influenced by one of the research pieces that I've seen with Forrester re Research, right? So they talk about a very interesting, um, you know, framework which can help any of us get online, all right, in terms of social media engagement. So step number one here, as we spoke about, is to clearly set the engagement goals. Based on your engagement goals, you think of your content strategy. Now, I want you to appreciate the fact that social media is less to do with platform and more to do with the nature of the content that you are able to put in there so that you can really inspire or connect with your various stakeholders. The next step here would be to, am I ready to hear and be heard? All right. So how, how are you going to be make sure that you are an active listener to somebody else's content? And how can you actively contribute into a versatile conversation piece. That becomes another very critical aspect. And over a period of, of output you're getting and how do you go about optimizing your content to go about doing this in a better manner as we go along. So this is what I refer to as the uh, social media playbook where the hero of the story is content. All right. Now, this is another thing and many of us, and I want to make this less technical and I will ensure that I send the slide deck across to you. Now, I just want you to appreciate the fact that at, at some point of time, all of us have actually taken this ladder, all right? This basically talks about different kinds of social media users, depending on, um, you know, whether, uh, depending on how you behave on social media. Many of us start off initially as being very inactive, all right? from that of mute spectators. I would just go on to social media to merely consume content, all right? To that of what you refer to as joiner. Now you want to, you are the kind of person who would actively try and connect with people. You want to join groups to be part of the conversation, but you still are not contributing with your content. You are just updating your presence and connecting with people. You move on to the next step in the ladder where you are now called a collector. Now, what does a collector do? Typically, he or she now starts sharing content. All right. Now, you're still not contributing. You still end up being a broadcaster of third party content, which is still a great start. From there on, many of us end up, uh, you know, positioning ourselves as critics. Now, I want to contextualize the word critics. It does not mean you are being critical of anything, but it basically means you start actively contributing your perspectives to somebody else's content. This could be that you see a post and you say you agree or you have a slightly different point of view. So you start contributing strongly to these forums and you start you know, contributing mainly in the form of opinions to already existing content. To that, from that point, you end up, you know, looking at yourself as a creator. Now, a creator is somebody who's actively involved in creating their own content, content which has their signature seal. All right. Now, let's understand this. Many times we sort of coexist in many of these phases. 
I could also be a creator who ensures that I write a blog every month or I put up a video every month. But at the same time, I'm actively involved in providing my perspectives as a critic to somebody else's content. But the reason why I brought up this framework is for us to understand it's perfectly okay, irrespective of which part of the ladder you belong to, because there's only one way up in life and that's the way up, all right? So let's not get demotivated that I've still not written a single piece of content and then how do I go about with it? Now, I want to close what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, if it sounds preachy with some very specific engagement that I have driven, now, I'm trying to keep my content as domain agnostic as possible because you can try and establish the same thing irrespective of whether you come from health sciences, whether you come from engineering, or whether you come from humanities, all right? And this will, will speak more to faculty members, this part of my presentation. And if there are any specific questions for other stakeholders, I'll be happy to take them. The reason being, the first step here is in 2012 is when I realized that there's an urgent need for me to look at social media to try and connect with my students, all right? Because I wanted to drive conversations which go beyond my class. And I wanted to, for the first time in the year 2013, I ran a course, and this course was called Global Digital uh, Global Retailing Strategy, where 100% of this course was run using Facebook as a medium. So it was like this, the entire class was divided into eight groups and they had to do the entire retail management course by actually visiting retail premises and log in their experiences. And then we would have a debriefing at the end of the day. Now I found that social was a very, very powerful way for me to enthuse the, the students on this new possibility. They loved the social currency and the attention that they were getting from others. All right. And also the fact that it could actually help convince me and many of my faculty members that, you know what, social is something which can enhance learning and not as necessarily a distractor to learning as it was being conceived way back then. So let's look at how I could manage to do this in terms of the first step before I could drive a class is to establish a very, very genuine connect to them. Now, this is something that many of us as facilitators will relate to, right? Now, whenever we have a class, whether it is the first day or the last day of the course, we have this class ritual of a group photographs. And many of the times it becomes a group selfie that I call a groupie. Now, many times we have this content, but we do nothing with it. Now, I've been a very strong believer in connecting and broadcasting this content on my social media pages. Because one thing that you actually realize is it helps people relate to the person behind the facilitator. All right. Now, I've done this even when I've had courses where I'm teaching out of my campus in Singapore. I've also done this very recently. This is as recent as April 17th when we had a course completely on Zoom. Don't feel sort of inhibited or shy of posting, um, you know, all those special moments that are part of your class ritual, as far as it does not really um, object towards anybody's you know, privacy concerns. So that is the first thing that I would talk about. Second, you know, I found a lot of faculty finding it very difficult to speak the student's lingo. Please don't shy away from it. It's cool to be cool. It does not make you any less serious as a faculty. So. Many times, you know, and I'm hoping these days return, you'll find that a huge student group has actually worked with you for an event. And what do you do then? You, you work with them and tell them thank you in the closing event. Can you do a small picture and write to them, thanking them for what they've done for you? Maybe by actually calling them with, you know, the hashtag. I want you to focus on the hashtag here where I said, I call them the awesomeness squad because these are the guys who are actually stretching themselves both way to make your event happen. So how can you, you know, sort of make it worthwhile for them to connect with you? And I would, I mean, I have a Bollywood bug. So you'll actually find a lot of my content, whether it is in the class or on social media, has a very strong Bollywood presence to it. And I realized that there was a spoiler in this page, which was my bag. So I, I also acknowledged my bag with you, all right, which anybody who's seen uh, you know, Zindagi Na Milegi Dubara will really connect with it. So try and get real, try and get very genuine with them and speak in their language. All right. Now, another aspect. Now, as a part of my consulting and research work, it takes me to some of the most 
interesting and the less uh, visited places in the world now in all of these places i use it as an opportunity to tell my students something that goes beyond content so what you see here is a lot of local content that i tend to put up which does not sound preachy so for you as a faculty to get students really connect with you on social media you can't afford to give them just heavy content from a from a concept paper or from a research paper you need to give them a slice of life so considering that i come from a marketing and branding attitude i also connect this to something that i want them to know and everybody understands the the tagline from longines and then i connect it to a very very local phenomena somebody that i appreciate when i was in orissa as a part of my research initiative now for a moment i want you to look at the kind of engagement that these kind of posts achieve and uh, i'm not a social media influencer for a for a happy faculty 122 responses are pretty interesting for me to do this on a daily basis all right moving on and this is important guys many times i have also found that you know students love to come back and connect with you on social media so on on special days like the birthday of somebody in your class or somebody that you taught but is no longer in the class can you go back and tag a picture of them and then wish them genuinely now you actually see the the picture here where two of my students won the best internship award and and i'm actually going and telling them you know have a great life ahead and i i strongly remember this day and i remember you all right and you actually find again look at the engagement numbers people love these kind of acknowledgments right so go back and not just talk about what's happening today and try and connect with something which has happened with you earlier but the reason why i've taken the liberty to bring these things from my social media um you know pages is because if i can do it i'm sure any of us can and the objective that we spoke about was very simple how can i genuinely get a connect with my students is what i was trying to elaborate here now that is a perhaps more informal aspect of connect now let me look at if i want to continue having a far more uh, formal connect that i want to harbor with my peers how can i use social media for it? so i'm going to now try and take you through the kind of content that i'm very comfortable putting up on linkedin all right for instance i found many times on linkedin the content and and a lot of youngsters in fact post in the covid phase linkedin has become far more an interesting place than it ever was before right the reason being many times you are only there looking for jobs so the moment you get you you add somebody they tell you that they are looking for a job nothing wrong but that used to be the predominant means of communication or the second aspect they are trying to sell something out to you all right now let's understand this social media is like a mega beach party more interesting you are as a person you can manage to get better quality conversations so on a platform as formal as linkedin kindly not just share content that you found who's part of your network but try and create stories or share stories about what you want to talk about so this was a very very interesting post that i found yesterday um from uh, you know uh, a fellow acquaintance dr uh, shashank shah from harvard business school and he has written a very nice book uh, on the tata story all right and so every single day he posts a very very interesting story about one of the tata brands so try and connect this um, to what you want to talk about with your students right or or with your peers it adds a lot of value uh, when you give it that your touch rather than you know just sharing content blindly this is something that is is very very important to me as a person many times we look at social media as a means to broadcast and dump social media works very well if by nature you are resourceful and you have the heart to be generous as much as we want to leverage on the power of social media for ourselves find ways to be generous and resourceful you know a, a, a friend who is looking for you know for recruiting people you know given a very interesting way a spin to that content so that you can get the right candidates for the company that you look at it could be an entry level position or it could be a very strategic position so try and help others try and be generous when you're using this and and i mean this even on linkedin all right humanize what you stand for 
Now, many times, many of us would have created some great projects with students as guides, all right? Or this is another great input for those of you um, who may be working with the corporate relationship team. Many of you, our students do some phenomenal work as a part of their internship uh, initiatives. Give them a great presence on your handle on social media, on LinkedIn especially. Now, because let's understand this, when you guide somebody, you're actually learning in the process and the best part of you're getting paid for those hours. Try and, you know, make it worthwhile for yourself and for them by actually showcasing their, their work with a very interesting spin again on, on social medias like LinkedIn that you look at. Last but not the least is this. Please don't always tell them what, what you stand for. Show them. Sometimes when you show them, it makes you feel very vulnerable. So I, I've, but, but it's perfectly okay because you're as human as anybody else. So I strongly believe that irrespective of the platform that you use for, the, the basic goal with which you want to connect with people is what will determine what platform that you go with and more importantly, the content that you want to share. Last but not the least, all right, I want to sort of um, talk to you about a great learning that I had a couple of days ago when I connected with Professor Mansoor, all right, who's part of... Uh, uh, Nanyang, Nanyang uh, Business School, he actually uses social media very, very powerfully to connect with um, the external stakeholders. Now, many of us struggle at times to find a very relevant speaker to a class, right? Because you want to come up with somebody who students like to hear. So look at the post that he puts up here, where he actually says that, you know, I always do this in my class, so if you're a professional who wants to, to speak to my students, please comment or message and I'll be more than happy to bring you to my class. So find some, I mean, and this is not really rocket science, but it's great presence of mind and a fantastic practice to expand your network, to try and get more um, flavor and content into your class, all right? And I would strongly recommend that those of us who are interested to learn more on best practices of social media, in terms of using LinkedIn for better higher ed communication, consider connecting with Professor Mansoor, all right? And there's a lot that we can learn together on. So I'm going to leave you guys with this, that social media at the end of the day is not about focusing on how to do social. Unless by nature you cannot be a social person, you can do zilch on social media, all right? So with that, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be sort of happy to take any questions towards the end. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smita, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, may I now uh, request uh, Mr. Nilashish from Google to uh, make his points? Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Professor Raviraj. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Smita. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I think that, that uh, there was a lot of learning for me. I'm sure there is a greater learning for uh, the audience as well. Uh, and. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Harsha, for, for the opening uh, you know, speech that you gave. That really helps put uh, things into perspective. So just to uh, perhaps give a background of what my uh, you know, career life has been. Uh, so I've spent uh, more than 13 plus years at Google, and most of that has been with uh, digital marketing or digital marketing space. Uh, considering, uh, you know, Dr. Smitha, that you have covered most of the uh, aspects of social media. What I would like to focus for the audience is a um, bit of my experience, how I have seen the space and also from a digital marketing perspective. Uh, so with that, uh, I will, I will uh, start uh, with my points. And, uh, and first of all, thank, thank you so much for uh, having me on this platform and uh, hope you all are you know, staying safe. And uh, I would like to start saying that uh, we are in a cusp of major change. And uh, I'm sure you must have guessed by now what that major change is. Uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic uh, that we are currently facing. And that is really going to change the way companies, institutions, and businesses will work. So, you know, if you uh, if you have seen the background that I'm currently set in, it's purely a work from, from, from home uh, background. And perhaps that's going to be the new normal, or maybe a hybrid version of that would be the new normal going forward. So essentially what 
we will end up doing we will end up studying from home we are already buying from home through e-commerce uh, we will continue to do that more so in the coming days and obviously in terms of seeking entertainment from home uh, so the point i'm trying to make here or rather retreat again is that online slash digital presence is going to be the norm it was perhaps good to have uh, in the pre covid era but post covid era it is it will be absolutely difficult to manage without the the online presence or the digital presence and as dr smita had correctly pointed out in her presentation uh, some of the benefits have really uh, called out there uh, so let me let me uh, let me let me i have what i have done is divided my points into a couple of uh, areas one is uh, how would digital online presence look for institutions and the next part is how does that look for individuals uh, so i will not report i will not repeat some of the points which have already been covered but i'll try to uh, kind of share my experience uh, so for institutions what what do i think is a good uh, you know good reference of of digital presence i think the first and the foremost thing i know it is basic some of you may know it but the first and the foremost thing is having a good website that is very very key according to research in in us 80% of the students college bound students in us they look at the website to get relevant information about courses about uh, you know other things in india perhaps it will be little low because uh, here you know the famous famous the more famous institutions there are more number of students uh, than than vacancies there but this is more important for colleges and institutions which are relatively new for them i think the digital digital presence should start with having a very good optimized engaging website that's one the website not i mean it should uh, and the other part is it should render properly on mobile mobile or mobile devices as well because what we have seen internally or otherwise that mobile query growth has grown like double digits so net net you should have a very good website which works perfectly on desktop and you should have most of those you know uh, it should it should render as well if not better on a mobile device uh, so so that's that's the basic that's the key uh, to me then as mentioned by my previous speaker social media channels are obviously very very important like youtube facebook twitter and instagram i'm just naming a few there must be uh, you know of the very niche ones which can also help but i'm just naming the more the more famous one uh, just to maybe give some context uh, harvard university there their youtube subscribe their youtube channel has about uh, 1.33 million subscribers uh, if i compare that to i think some of the top universities of india that would be around 300 to 400k so that's the benchmark that's the gap perhaps somebody can look at in terms of where they are and where they should be and uh, you know uh, youtube channels or for that matter most of the media as as mentioned could be used like crisis management i think lot of lot of institutions are doing it uh, for crisis management including covid related information because there is an information overload uh, students parents everybody is worried uh, they don't know what to uh, believe they don't know what to uh, read or what uh, or where to look for so if as an institution or as a college i'm i'm able to guide them to the right resources through my official platform i think that goes a long way in terms of brand building uh, definitely education uh, is basic and key that has also be that also needs to be there reconnecting with students honoring student batches uh, as perhaps also mentioned by my previous speaker i think these three to four these three points are are very very important 
I would like to pause here and then reiterate one important point, I think, which is more important and the base of all this. Content is the king, king or content is the queen. How much ever technology you want to use, but if you're not putting up good content online, you might get that initial engagement, but it will start tapering off. So ensure that you're providing high quality content. So that's very, very important. Uh, the next part is in terms of experimenting with paid media, you know, pay per click marketing or, you know, search engine marketing. It's important for sure. It has to be goal oriented. If you are looking for admissions or signups uh, for certain courses, ensure that it is timed uh, so that, you know, you are really going out for that particular audience when they are looking for it. So it's basically need based. Uh, I would say brand building can be a year round where you have to ensure that you are, you know, top of mind for, for your uh, prospective, uh, you know, uh, clients, students or the consumer base. So two aspects here, you just need to time it correctly, uh, depending upon what your uh, needs are. Um, the key is to ensure that you are present where your consumers are. Uh, I know maybe at times we don't want to consider students as consumers, so, so pardon me there, but I'm just trying to say that wherever your students are, wherever you think your prospective students are, we need to be present on those platforms. It's, it's kind of a, you know, a simple uh, equation there. And I think one more important thing is uh, like, you know, what, what differentiates your uh, institute or your college from the rest of the institute. I think the institute's value mission could be very well communicated through, uh, through different media, including social media like, like YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, and, uh, and a little, little old fashioned bragging. I know uh, in India, perhaps what we tend to talk about more is like, uh, you know, uh, the salary packages, you know, the students get, get when they are passing out, uh, but perhaps go beyond that, talk about maybe, you know, academic achievements, talk about sports achievements, talk about culture achievements. Uh, some of those things uh, really help in ensuring that you have a positive vibe associated uh, with, the, with, the, with the institution that, uh, that you're looking at. I, I, the other thing is, uh, you know, the, the state of the art facilities, research, uh, Somehow Indian institutions, you know, they have got a name uh, that we're not perhaps that good in research. Okay, we perhaps may be very good in teaching, but when it comes to research, we are we are slightly behind uh, our Western counterparts. So if you're doing some path-breaking research, to, to, you know, tell the audience, to tell the world out there that you are doing those things, I think that really acts as a kind of a, a you know, a differentiator. And... Uh, the, the other important thing is obviously the, the other important, uh, the most important stakeholder are our students and there should be regular engagement with our students through the social media platform. Uh, because going forward, I definitely believe that there would be a hybrid model in, in a lot of things, including uh, education, uh, you know, uh, education also. So it's very, very important to engage uh, the students who are perhaps uh, not on campus, who are off campus. So they are equally uh, engaged. They want to be equally engaged. They want, they are quite motivated. So that, uh, that is one space which we uh, uh, need to, uh, need to do. Uh, and uh, encouraging user generated content. I think it was briefly touched upon. I think the hashtags are very important as, uh, uh, as a marketing tool, as uh, engagement tool. So it's important to uh, use the relevant hashtag, relevant, uh, uh, you know, such messaging. Uh, I, I think a lot of government institutions are doing that with great effect. Some of the traffic police departments are doing it to great effect uh, by using, say, IPL and IPL, uh, you know, uh, talk and engaging uh, their consumer base. So I think that's very important, ensuring uh, ensuring that you are using the relevant, uh, you know, hashtags and also picking on the topics which are which are very very uh, very very topic because uh, sometimes social media may have a may have a shorter shelf value. So the important part is to kind of stay on top of it and and ensure 
uh, that that uh, you are right up there. Uh, and uh, so I, I know I, I will keep it. I will keep it uh, short because you know Nikesh also has to speak because I think uh, you know Dr. Smith gave a fantastic presentation about how to make your uh, presence felt on uh, social media um, as well as uh, some of the things that you've mentioned in LinkedIn. Uh, for LinkedIn as well, I think from a from a professional, I think LinkedIn is a space which works well from an institution plus plus an individual point of view as well to have a good presence. Uh, unfortunately, you know, top of mind for for business or uh, you know professional social networking is LinkedIn. So it is it is very very important to to have a good uh, presence on on LinkedIn. That's one thing. Um, and it's also be it's also relevant to be part of uh, important uh, groups where you are having strong collaboration or strong engagement. Um, so that's that's what uh, is important. From an individual point of view, what I would want to say is uh, let's not go out there and make our presence felt on social media just because we wish to network. I think we want to we should. We should be. Uh, we should ideally want to make those genuine connections. More so in a in a in a uh, situation like COVID, where where life is so uncertain. I think in the last six to eight months, I have connected with more classmates, more friends, more people who were just acquaintances than in the last six to ten years. Because I think life has given us an opportunity to kind of take a pause and rethink some of the priorities. So, what I would suggest is. Just go out there, uh, you know. You know, if you don't have anything specific to talk, just like start with what's going on or how are you feeling. I think that's very, very important in uh, today's scenario as well. And those genuine connections, irrespective of the medium, uh, is very important. And that translates to some of your good uh, presence that you can have in uh, different platforms. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is. What should we be careful while? What should we be careful about social media? Let's not, you know, go through some fact-checking website. If not, just Google search it. See uh, if if genuine, uh, you know, uh, news agencies are also carrying that story. Do not share them as is. That's a, that's a very dangerous trend. Um, don't put any. Anything and everything. So, what is perhaps okay in your closed group discussions with friends and family? Social media is out there. Please don't do that. I have known friends who have lost job opportunities because of the unnecessary things that they have put out without really thinking through. So, that's very, very important. Uh, you need to be, we all need to be careful of what we put out there. And uh, last but not the least, very important. I mean, it's important to stay off devices as well. Let's uh, let's uh, ensure that we have uh, non-digital time. We have limited screen time, especially when we perhaps uh, when we when we call it a day, an hour. Because that's what I've seen with some of my leaders. They always say, you know, an hour before the before going to bed or you know having dinner. Let's go off uh, the the devices because. Nothing's going to really break if you don't reply to that email in the next 15, 20 minutes, or, or in the next, you know, four or five hours. Uh, so, so that's how I would want to end. Uh, uh, that's this is mostly based on some of the experience that I've had, and happy to take any questions uh, when we when we open uh, open it up for that. Uh, so, uh, so that would be it from my side. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anilashish, uh, for that uh, wonderful insight on uh, digital media marketing and uh, LinkedIn. Uh, may I now request uh, Mr. Nikesh uh, to make his uh, points? Hello, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rivraj, for having me here. Uh, I'd like to thank my both my co panelists. Uh, also, they gave amazing, uh, valuable content in terms of uh, the perspective in which uh, uh, you should uh, think about using social media and also how exactly to go about it. Now, uh, I would like uh, to take you guys through uh, a medium that is relatively new, uh, 
uh, in the social or digital space, if I may, especially in, in India, in our country, right? And uh, I'm going to share my screen and run you through a couple of points and also uh, give you an idea about how exactly you can use this or to start uh, using these platforms. Um, let me just share the screen. All right, uh, uh, Mr. Raj, uh, is can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Okay. So, uh, as it says, I'm a co-founder of uh, Chat Radio. Uh, we are the chat marketing agency that helps businesses uh, grow and scale through um, strategic chat marketing practices. All right. And I would like to start with a quote by the CEO and the chairman of Facebook, if not the biggest social media platform, but one of the top social media platforms in the world. He said, if we were to start to build a social network today, we would start with messaging first. This was said last year in Facebook's annual conference. Now, I would like to state that we live in a world where conversations matter. Uh, communications matter, right? Uh, to create a, a personal connection with people. Now, I would like to say you guys should use uh, conversations to grow your network, to grow the connections, to grow the, the personal connections with people. And what do I mean by that? I basically mean to say is leverage chat platforms like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, iMessages, which you have available on your mobile to facilitate conversations and personal growth or organizational growth, right? Now, I know you'll be thinking, why should you be using uh, messaging apps, right? Now, it's, if there's one thing that has always been true in business or professional growth, uh, it's that individuals and organizations tend to gravitate towards the communication channels that consumers are already using. I mean, that just makes sense, right? Back when people communicated through uh, handwritten letters, uh, direct mail was born, right? And when uh, phones became common, so did telemarketing. Now, the rise of email led to the rise of email marketing. And today, today, people communicate on messaging apps like WhatsApp, Facebook, iMessage, etc. And uh, over the past few years, it's fair to say the popularity of these apps has simply skyrocketed. Now, to give you an idea, all right, by the late 2016 or early 2017, the pick for messaging apps like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp had taken over the pick for social media networks uh, in terms of global monthly active users. And WhatsApp itself, its own, has about 2 billion active users and Facebook Messenger has a, about 1.4 billion active users on a, on a monthly basis, right? And these apps are growing twice as fast as Facebook itself at a 30% uh, year over year. Now, how would you use or leverage these platforms to create a professional or even organizational presence uh, on these platforms, right? So to start with, uh, what we could do is to create a business profile. Uh, if, whether it's on Facebook or uh, Facebook Messenger or even WhatsApp, what you can start with is having a business profile. Have a key uh, uh, WhatsApp pro a business profile or a Facebook profile where it, it uh, gives the audience or the person who lands on your, on, on your WhatsApp profile an understanding of uh, what you guys do in terms of description or to give an idea of the availability uh, or even uh, the addresses and the locations possible, right? And another feature that you can uh, of course, uh, take um, use of uh, for your WhatsApp uh, uh, business profiles uh, are the quick replies. Now, quick replies lets you save and reuse messages you frequently send, so you can easily answer common question in no time. Uh, with educational organizations, we uh, tend to see this pattern, even with uh, the clients that we work with, is that there are a lot of questions that uh, come which have a pattern which are repeated over and over regarding certain topics. Now, you can easily automate or uh, you know, keep this as quick reply so that the moment someone asks late, something related to that, you can actually uh, uh, send these quick replies, uh, which doesn't take time, and this happens with the click of a button, 
right? And, and now the next feature is obviously categorizing each of these conversations and each of uh, uh, these content is very important so that you can uh, optimize your content at later stages, like right? how uh, uh, as Dr. Smitha had mentioned, right? You need to understand what are they press, what are they looking for. For example, if um, uh, a student is walking into a university, or I myself have been there, right? I was looking at university colleges to join, and of course, my first question uh, is which one to go for, and I have a lot of questions. Now, the moment I talk to uh, an agent or uh, uh, admission assistant, but these questions that I ask, that kind of come from the interests I have, right? I might uh, pertain to uh, what is the lifestyle, uh, or how, what are the facilities the, the universities provide. So, labeling these conversations would help us to uh, give them the content they require in the mediums they use, right? Now, one of my, my favorite uh, features is having automated messages. Now, uh, this can be used in, uh, in two ways. One is to, the moment someone messages you, someone uh, tries to get in touch with you on these platforms, you uh, can set an automated message, which, uh, be like, which would be like a creepy message to introduce yourself or your organization, to give them uh, a bit of, of content about yourself. It can even be a video to uh, do like an introduction about your university or college or even the courses. Right, and at the same time, if you are a professional, uh, and uh, say for example, if you're going over for a weekend, and someone messages you, then often times we see that uh, you know if your vacation is a weekend, it's hard to uh, reach someone. But at the same time, uh, we don't know when it would be a good time. So you can use these automated messages uh, to uh, send um, a message when someone tries to reach you, and you can tell them uh, as, as an automated message that I would be over so and so time, or you can contact me in two days, or I'm out of the office, you can get a task and so and so time, right? Now, coming to organizations, uh, uh, one of the key things is uh, having the student engagement and also their motivation uh, up, right? These students uh, nowadays are already accustomed to uh, instant messaging platforms and, and social media, whether they want to communicate with each other or even research topics or find the best sign in help, they switch to these platforms. Right. Uh, most of these points I just mentioned are uh, definitely does uh, pertain to both individuals and organizations. But now, if we are to focus as uh, as an organization as a whole, you can enhance these uh, and take this above and beyond and automate the entire systems using chatbots on these very messaging platforms, uh, like how we do a chat data for our clients. Right, you can automate admission assistance. Like I was saying, the, uh, the moment I'm uh, uh, looking at colleges, there are a lot of things that I require when I inquire about the course. I want to understand the prospect of the duration of the course, what is the cost, the pricing will be, the documentation guidelines, and uh, these are the, the regular questions that we get. Every of these uh, these uh, uh, flows in terms of your uh, regeneration, requalification, or even admission assistance can be automated from your top funnel to the last, right? The, the person who receives the content or the receive the data of these students will have an entire uh, array of uh, understanding what exactly they're looking for instead of staying on the phone with them for hours and over and over and still, you know, missing out on uh, probably some of the, um, the, the key required details uh, from them. Now, another thing that we can automate are the course FAP, right? Uh, regarding the courses, and uh, to understand uh, what is the curriculum like, how are the relations of the is what are the internship opportunities that the university or the organization can uh, provide to the students, because which uh, is one of the key factors that definitely a lot of uh, students look at while um, enrolling to a course. Also, one of the major things that you have to always keep in mind uh, in using these uh, platforms is. Dr. Smita and uh, of course Mr. Vilashish uh, focus on telling you uh, that content is king. Content is king, always have been, and that uh, obviously uh, will rule uh, the entire space. It, it definitely is, uh, uh, if I may put it, it definitely is uh, the key thing that has to go out to your audience or to your customers or your prospects or stakeholders for that matter. Right? You can use these platforms to uh, to give. Uh, uh, Content without any friction, right? Messaging platforms are where everybody is available these days. If you're talking about WhatsApp, in India, if you, if you know, everybody is a WhatsApp, right? And out of the two billion people I just mentioned to you guys, almost one fourth of it is in India, and that's a lot of penetration you can get, 
right? But be mindful of the content that you put out. It's not a space uh, to be spam. The audience will give them uh, a try to you know sell to them more. I would say it's a platform that you can leverage for your brand and your personality, and even uh, to the extent of using it for uh, uh, online reputation management as well. Right? You can send your content like your blogs, your videos, images, or even documents. Because when you create content, the next key part or the next addition to this whole thing is how do you deliver this content? Right? Distribution is a content is getting distribution has to be uh, the really in this place, right? You need to know how to reach your audiences. In, in a way, it doesn't uh, interview into your private space, right? So you can use these platforms uh, very effectively uh, to deliver these content because uh, in terms from uh, uh, an angle, uh, marketing angle, or even to put yourself out there, WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger gives uh, an open rate, uh, what we call as an open rate, which means if you send a message or an email to someone, you should click and open that uh, message or, um, or, or, or the email. Now, compared to emails, uh, these messaging platforms have almost a, a, a 5 to 10x of the results in terms of open rates on emails people get in anywhere between 15 to 20 percent these days, right? It, it's, it was a, a, a way better uh, than that uh, years ago, but. Uh, Yeah, I think we uh, lost Nikesh. I'm trying to uh, get in touch with him quickly. Sure. sure. Yeah. I think this, this is also one of the issues of uh, the whole online setup. Sometimes these things do happen, but uh, I, this, I, I believe this is a part and parcel and uh, things are improving uh, quite a bit yeah. so hopefully we'll get him back online soon. so uh, i think until uh, nikesh comes back maybe we can take a couple of questions from the audience okay oh, he's back i think nikesh is back yeah 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 well, uh, i'm really sorry guys they just, just talked out as we were working to go right so um let me uh, take it from where i left off um, Right. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Yeah, so what I was saying is that these mediums are very effective and you can use these for both uh, a personal and professional and as an organizational perspective, right? Now, I want to talk about the next big thing in these messaging platforms. They are introducing uh, WhatsApp Pay in India. It's in the beta uh, uh, stage right now. But as we go forward, what we're going to see is that this is going to be a revolutionary uh, form of uh, a change in commerce, if I may. Right? Uh, reason for that is, uh, as uh, we obviously have a lot of uh, payment options these days, like uh, big uh, companies like Google Pay, uh, Paytm, PhonePay, etc. But uh, one thing uh, that they don't have is uh, a conversational medium, right? A conversational medium as in uh, they, WhatsApp makes it, or the messaging platform makes it or easy at uh, sending money or transferring money or even uh, purchasing something out of your store or even for your uh, services, right? Uh, making it very easy and frictionless in terms of uh, the entire uh, commerce of things. And that's why I'm going to say this uh, uh, feature, WhatsApp Pay, once it holds up probably by the year or the next year, uh, it's going to change how, um, how we do commerce uh, over these platforms, right? Now, I want to tell you guys 
that companies like uh, companies and agencies like us are at the forefront of this, uh, you know, helping professionals and organizations like you in changing the way uh, they converse with their uh, audience. But what you have to focus now, uh, focus on is that why now? Why now uh, should we be focusing on uh, messaging platforms? Uh, the reason for that is now more than ever, messaging apps have taken a front seat uh, because of the climatic situations of the pandemic. Right? Uh, it has changed how uh, we work. The work culture uh, has changed. The education system, students are learning from home. Everybody is at home, and the easiest way to uh, reach them. Uh, are the mobile phones, as, as uh, Mr. Vilash was saying, uh, majority of the users have turned into uh, uh, mobile as a medium of uh, uh, looking at content, consuming content, and uh, which has resulted in change in the application system. Now, what you have to understand uh, is that it is not only relevant right now. These systems, these uh, systems are not going to uh, change or not going to go back, right? What, uh, like Milash was saying, this might be a hybrid situation where how we can go forward, this might be the new normal. So, what I mean to say is, these are systems that are here to stay. And uh, as this is just the early stages uh, of these uh, communication changes, it is very crucial to be part of what is going to be the future for your organizations and also the personal group. And with that, I would like to conclude and uh, say this again. If we were to start to build a social network uh, today, we would start with uh, messaging first. Thank you and more to you, Reverend Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Nikesh. Uh, now I think uh, we will uh, straight away, I think we have very less time. We about some 20, 25 minutes. So uh, I think I'll straight away take some questions. There are several questions. Um, one question uh, from Dr. Lakshmi uh, Suresh. Uh, so she's asking about, uh, about online trolling and online stalking. Uh, I think I'll direct this question to Nilashish. Uh, so she's asking, what are the cyber laws that we must be, you know, we must adhere to, and what are the laws that mandates in the IPC, uh, if there are any uh, regarding online trolling and online stalking? Uh, and also, I think I'll add uh, to this question. Uh, maybe uh, can you also talk about the privacy issues also along with this? And others can also contribute. I'll direct this question to Nirashish. Uh, Thanks, uh, Ravidas. But uh, you know, um, unfortunately, I am not a cyber law expert. But uh, what I can say is, all uh, you know, unfortunately, at times it's it's a catch-up game for the for the uh, legal institutions or the law enforcement agencies. But uh, every uh, every state, every uh, you know, country has got its own uh, cyber laws and uh, uh, that should be taken advantage of however because i'm not an expert i will i will refrain from me making further comments okay. regarding your question about the privacy part there are every company is building tools uh, within their in existing infrastructure uh, folks should feel empowered to look for them and uh, at, and the ultimate uh, aim for most of the companies is to give the give the users uh, a chance to control or a chance to uh, you know select what data they want to put out that we have seen in multiple forums including the likes of facebook instagram as well as google where you really get a uh, where you do get a, a control of um, what you want to share how much you want to share um, i think dr smitha mentioned about profile being locked i have also kept my uh, profile on facebook being locked uh, face i have also locked my uh, profile on facebook so uh, tools are evolving I'm sure uh, you know we all could do much better in the space, but uh, you know we are uh, learning and and companies are are improving or developing on this front. Um, so that's what I would say. I'm happy for others to uh, chip in as well. Uh, Dr. Spita, do you want to comment? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, Nilash is very useful inputs uh, uh, more from a policy point of view, and this is what we are all looking at with the new bill. Uh, which could get passed, which could have a very similar implication like the GDPR for us in the Indian context. 
Now, um, you know, uh, Professor Raviraj, I'll try to um, uh, uh, respond to this question more from a student-faculty relationship point. Yes, yes, yes. Now, one of the biggest, uh, I mean, rather pet fears for a faculty is, will social media make this boundary go invisible? such that I let them into my world where I could be poked fun at, all right? Now, one of the things uh, that I, I want to make this, it's a, I think it's a great question to take up, mainly to set this context. I think whenever you're going to let your social profile open to other stakeholders, especially students to connect with you, day one of my class, I set the rules of the game which is to talk to them about the concept of social media etiquette. Okay. Now, when we use the word social media, many times we look at it just as a Facebook or an Insta profile. I think the simplest way to understand social media could also be your WhatsApp. So if I'm going to have a WhatsApp group, which I always have when I'm having a live class going on, you set very clearly the non-negotiable rules of the game, which is about mutual respect, and two important words or values that I stand for, honor and humility. Now, once you actually set these as a part of your etiquette, and if you occasionally find an offender, you actually take on this one-on-one -on -one to deal with it offline, and then bring this back and create normalcy into uh, the online world. So I think setting up these rules are pretty much part of a faculty's responsibility if you are trying to use social media as a strong way to connect with your students. I hope that sort of, you know, sort of uh, from an operational point of view that gives you some insights. Nikesh, is there anything else you'd like to add to it? Um, I would uh, like to come across this question from a more of a, a personal or individual perspective, right? When we are creating content uh, and putting up on these platforms, one thing we have to be mindful of is that be responsible for the content that you create and also share. Like how Nilashis was saying, if you see a content there, not necessarily it might be true, right? Validate it. You can do a Google search. You can search about these things just as easy as typing it on Google and try to find if it's truth or there's some truth to it or not. Because otherwise, it might kind of uh, get into a space that it would hurt people's feelings, right? Because it might be wrong altogether. So be mindful. Be responsible and uh, uh, try to take, take ownership of what you put out there. That's what I would say. Sure. Professor Ravi. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I also want to ask uh, all of you. So uh, because of the pandemic, uh, uh, even before the pandemic, there were several online courses available. But because of the pandemic, uh, there has been a rush, you know, towards uh, learning online. But I also want to see the difference in the sense, uh, so it is more of a self-learning. So I, there are a lot of online courses uh, by, provided by Google. There are, the LinkedIn is providing online courses. There are a range of other service providers who are providing online courses. So, so many, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, courses on engineering to, uh, you know, to communication, to personal development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this whole idea of self-learning, is it going to be a new norm, one? Second, how does, how will it, you know, affect the educational institute, the regular educational institute? Is it going to be, uh, you know, is it going to change the scenario for educational institutes? Should the teacher uh, be changing some of the pedagogical methods in order to adapt to these things? Uh, Dr. Smita? Yeah, Professor Ravi, I think that's a great question. Um, my answer is yes and no. Let me first talk about the yes. Um, what the pandemic actually has done with us is make us reflect better as facilitators. Okay, For instance, um, there are a whole lot of courses that are available, you name it, whether it is Coursera or any of the platforms that are available. But what it has also ha uh, sort of led us to is the heightened importance of mentorship, which is as important as education and content per se. So just to give you a context, as much as I've been trying, I mean, I've been teaching online even pre the pandemic uh, through an engaged learning program that we have as a part of our course. So however, 
in the pandemic context i have found that my students both current and past reaching out to me for mentorship far more than ever before so do institutions have a role to play here maybe the content is available online but the teacher is not available for them with you know who can inspire them who can spell possibilities for them so as a facilitator as a teacher you are more as you know you need to redefine your role as somebody who can inspire people on the possibilities and help them navigate into this complex vuca that's another jargon which i'm very worried about a world than you know trying to parrot the same concepts that are there on coursera and i was actually just talking about this to dr sa professor sadna and dr harsh uh, uh, harsha sometime back i think my competitor is netflix my competitor is not another faculty teaching that course because while this person is on zoom my student is at apps actual on a netflix window so how can my content be more compelling than what he's listening to on netflix so faculty need to reinvent their game that is the first part that i wanted to talk about um ravi uh, professor ravi if you could just talk to me about the, what was the second question so uh, so one was uh, do the teachers have um, to change their pedagogical yeah. methods in order yeah. to adopt yeah. these situation yeah yes yeah yeah, yes. yeah. so the, the second was is it going to change the uh, nature of educational institutes because of these kind of courses available yes because i think what's going to happen is people will come to you more for your faculty than for your classrooms so faculty become the center of your uh, institute so i think you need to really try and focus on how do you empower because an empowered faculty is an empowered classroom so i think mm -hmm. students come to you for that all right not about facilities anymore facilities are hygiene factors but the real differentiators would be faculty who can drive value right so that's going to be the center so i i want to yeah uh, nilashish want to do yeah to just just one thing i want to add here is uh, 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 just to, just to maybe a, a request to all the all the faculty teachers you know uh, just just keep your mind open you know getting comfortable with technology just comes with a bit of practice and time uh, because i definitely see this hybrid model you know going forward um, so it's not like one against another it's i mean both in some form or the other will uh, will survive uh, and uh, you know as dr smith was saying in terms of uh, you know differentiation if if faculty and the content that's been provided is the differentiating factor then it makes sense to just feel we you know get more com comfortable with the idea um, that's one so second thing is will uh, the courses that uh, will the courses which are online uh, will they uh, uh will i you know the, the regular courses will they fade away i don't think so because if you have to take courses by yourself that requires a lot of self starting initiatives sometimes it is possible sometimes it's not and you know it is there is a lot of merit in kind of a group setup where it's interactive and you are in that setting so i don't think that group setting or you know education in a group is going to go away but definitely uh, you know uh, teachers professors uh, have to be a little i um, mean have to get a little comfortable with tech, tech uh, tools yeah yeah thank you so uh, there's a question uh, from jack zackman uh, on social media platforms create uh, dopamine driven feedback loops that compel us to stay addicted how do we remain deeply focused uh, you know in work without any distractions and yet remain engaged and uh, dr smita said she would like to answer that yeah i think it's a it's a very interesting question uh, that has brought in um, addiction is normally sort of uh, looked at in very negative light right does it make us uh, you know so the difference between engagement and addiction is how consciously engaged are you on that platform right so i think the context of this entire narrative is about setting the goals being very conscious about why are you engaging with a platform and many of these platforms grow on you all right as in uh, you sort of start the stickiness factor ends up being very very high so that you may want to continue going there i think uh, the more conscious you are in terms of your point of engagement 
it would be more about better quality engagement and less about addiction that is one thing second aspect that i always try and practice is one hour of very strong digital detox however compelling that platform is or people love your post or everything that you are posting one hour of conscious digital detox is part of uh, you know a, a self learning uh, module for me sometimes it's extremely challenging because you really you know the smartphone really gets you those notifications which essentially means i want to be away from my smartphone as well so consciousness in what you're doing is will make all the difference before we uh, move on to another uh, question from the audience i just want to ask mr neela shish uh, what are the recent trends in uh, social media marketing and what could be the future of these uh, you know uh, businesses i mean social media marketing to be particular yeah i think a uh, great question i think i touched upon that a bit when we were talking about how an institution can market itself uh, you know uh, it's a similar concept how businesses can do as well you know when it comes to uh, say an upper funnel marketing then we look at uh, video we look at uh, chat we look at uh, social media when we go uh, as well as youtube uh, as an you know in which comes under video as we go down the funnel we would definitely look at say pay per click advertising search engine marketing uh, so so the idea is to create several touch points to engage the users in their in their uh, buying journey or uh, empower them to make the right decision um again uh, at the cost of repeating myself the pandemic has brought in a lot of uh, uh, paradigm shifts in how people are are uh, looking at online space digital marketing space now we see uh, you know car companies uh, selling selling cars you know end to end on the online platform it's not just directing people to the showrooms but you can buy a complete car you know on on uh, online um and uh, you know several other traditional businesses uh, so just just to uh, maybe sum up what i can say is uh, you know uh, the big shift that's happening is a lot of traditional businesses a lot of businesses which were not perhaps having a good digital footprint will move online and then there are different uh, solutions which are available across the various touch points speed uh, you know upper funnel uh, mid funnel or lower funnel that's that's there um, and uh, that's that is something which is uh, going to continue um yeah, yeah. and and can can you also uh, uh, help us uh, understand the idea of search engine optimization and search engine marketing can you uh, is it possible for you to break it down for us how does it work yeah so one one basic and the biggest difference is search engine optimization is free search engine marketing is pay per click marketing which is the paid part search engine optimization using various tools and techniques you ensure that your website uh, ranks you know uh, closer to the top on the organic search results on various search engines including google and uh, on all several keywords you know for example if if cars is a keyword which is important to you through search engine optimization you would want your website to rank higher that search engine optimization now the second part is search engine marketing which is basically a paid format where you bid for a term or bid for a keyword like car and then you would see your ad showing up on top of the search results so these are two okay. two uh, ways to basically show up on a search results page one would essentially be free one essentially would be paid for okay thank you so much so there's one question from abhijit pujari to uh, mr nikesh ghosh so he's asking uh, uh, whatsapp will whatsapp be the next google in the world in terms of content sharing and distribution uh, connectivity etc in in terms of sharing content i also want you to probably uh, talk about whatsapp for business this is something mm -hmm. uh, really new and not many people are aware of this and how can uh, uh, organizations and institutes um, you know can use make use of this particular platform all right Uh, so uh, actually, it's a great question uh, uh, because uh, uh, every platform on its own, uh, it's Google, WhatsApp, Facebook, each has a, a, a certain level of intent. I think uh, Dr. Smita had covered uh, this uh, part a little bit in her presentations, where she said 
LinkedIn has a format in which you uh, you know use uh, LinkedIn to share content. There is a certain level of professionalism you use compared to Facebook or Instagram, which can be more personalized, can be more casual. Uh, again, depending on how you use it. Now, uh, WhatsApp is a very great tool uh, in terms of sharing content and uh, not just WhatsApp alone. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take messaging back of it totally. Uh, and I would like to also uh, say that even Google is investing in what they call the RCS, the rich communication system, which is a protocol uh, basically between mobile and network carriers, uh, which uh, aim at replacing SMS, right? So, what they want to try and do is to create a system that would uh, help you use an SMS, uh, which is uh, part of your phones, uh, to create a, a rich communication medium like how a WhatsApp or even uh, for that matter, Facebook message provides you, right? So it is very key, and it is one of the major platforms in which uh, these, sorry, in which uh, uh, content can be distributed in a mindful manner, uh, and also to make sure they reach the right audiences, uh, and also to get good uh, results out of it, right? Now, uh, coming to the second question, by the way. WhatsApp business is definitely it's a new medium and a lot of businesses are still yet uh, to get into that space because uh, WhatsApp just released or uh, opened up their API uh, very recently compared to uh, Facebook Messenger which came into the picture way earlier about two years back in fact in 2016-2017 they opened the API. Now what do we mean by WhatsApp business API? So uh, WhatsApp business is basically an app that you can download for businesses where you can have everything they could invest in the community to all that going on inside that particular app. Now, how do you take it to the, to the next steps? So, organizations and uh, businesses, what uh, we help with is that we set up an entire automated system. Uh, like how we was saying, there's been a paradigm shift in uh, which uh, um, businesses have started thinking about their online presence, moving online, moving digital with all their presence. Now, this uh, requires a uh, uh, medium uh, to for that you can reach out. Google, obviously, the SEO, search engine optimization, SEO, and social media marketing is all very key. While uh, that being said, WhatsApp or messaging platform give you an upper hand with uh, using these platforms by creating chatbots to automate your entire funnel from start till the end. How we are just to say, we have clients that use the entirety of the funnel just to even sell cars, which is high ticket. Uh, model, not I'm not talking about uh, uh, it can be chocolate. These, these are high ticket value products, right? So, from the first inquiry that comes in in the funnel about inquiring about the card specs to the end transaction can happen in that single window, which gives you uh, more power and more control over your resources, right? Right now, you need, uh, I'm not saying human beings are not crucial in the system, of course, they are. I'm not asking to take out humans out of this because at any stage, humans are required to give that assistance. To give that personal touch at some point or the other, but uh, almost 80 to 90 percent of your product can be automated using these platforms. And businesses should start doing it, should start using those to utilize this in a situation like a, a pandemic right now that's going on. Because uh, that way, like I said, you can have less resources and also it gives you the flexibility to have your entire team. Uh, for example, my agency, we run, we run remotely, right? We, and my entire team is working. The country and this is pre pandemic. We started as a remote agency, and that has helped us a lot to adjust to uh, the entire pandemic situation because we already had our systems in place, which uh, totally helped us. And also, because we have we didn't even automation, we didn't even have this automated system, and it, it was a breeze, it was a piece of cake for us to get into the system already. I hope I've answered that question. Uh Professor Ravi, if I could just add one more aspect to what Nikesh so beautifully explained, right? Now, this is with regard to uh, Mr. Abhijit's question about yes, WhatsApp is going to be, uh, you know, the next big Google for content sharing. I think one critical aspect we need to acknowledge here is who are my stakeholders and which part of the world are they in? All right. As I was telling you, many times I have, uh, you know, uh, about half a dozen different nationalities in my class. And when I have a, a, a group where I have more uh, students from China, Taiwan, or Belarus, you'll find that they've never even ever had a WhatsApp interface on their phone, right? Now, if I'm talking to a student cohort, which is Dubai-based, it makes more sense for me to speak to them on Botan rather than use WhatsApp. So let us not really look at um, 
platforms being as important as what you want to do with those platforms so your decision on of platform choice has a lot to do with the geography with where you are trying to engage with so uh, for instance again the demographic if you're talking to a slightly younger demographic maybe snapchat is a far more persuasive medium for you to speak across geographies than looking at a more traditional medium so i think right now whatsapp is on a high in the indian context maybe 2 years down the line you'll have something else which becomes far more compelling than whatsapp so let's create content which is typically platform agnostic and then learns the techniques to use the might of a platform to push it right than getting too centered over a particular platform oh, thank you I, i i think we will take last two more questions this question is from uh, shrinivas pajataya he is a research scholar from kuwempu university shimoga he is asking how to differentiate knowledge from overflow of information on social media uh, anyone nilashish would you want to talk about uh, uh, how to look for sources and say maybe reverse image searches Uh, i i think here i would say uh, you know as must have been said in other forums as well the the medium is the message i would definitely uh, go through the through the source of any any material that's out there and uh, that would give me a sense of how reliable it is uh, have the authors been cited uh, have sources been cited so here i would say again uh, as uh, dr smitha was saying here the medium is agnostic you know if a particular content is put up online i would definitely want to see what kind of sources have been used have authors been credited have uh, the right citations have been placed so that will essentially differentiate between uh, information and knowledge um, so yeah I, i think that that would be it and and again there are uh, you know uh, journals ha- having said that because i don't belong to the academic field i can't comment on the Uh, nature of the journals or academic uh, things which are out there but i'm sure there are some academic journals or some uh, you know channels which are more reputable than the others and they do their own uh, you know uh, filtering they they do their own gatekeeping and that kind of adds credibility to it uh, so that's how i would put it are are there any uh, fact checking tools as such uh, available uh, where <laughs> it is available for common users which they can use to cross check facts and sources yeah there are multiple fact checking uh, tools that's available only i mean all somebody needs to do is just maybe google fact checking tool there are international uh, lead reputed fact checking organization i'm sh- uh, i think uh, correct me if i'm wrong i think bookslayer is one uh, one such uh, you know uh, organization or tool which is quite popular uh, so i mean i would say uh, this is what i would do uh, maybe if, if i have to verify the authenticity authenticity of the story i would uh, google it i would see if uh, you know proper if a reputable institutions or reputable websites or portals are also carrying the story by simply uh, searching for a couple of maybe sentences of something which has been shared with me that's one second thing is i would do a do a a, a, a search of top facts checking site and then uh, i wouldn't go beyond say the third or fourth i would just look at the top two or three and then if i see a particular trend being out there then that's how i would look at it again uh, the more important part is to check the temptation of sharing things as is pause for a moment read through it because some of them are so ridiculous that you you don't need a fact checking website you know that those things are uh, you know exists exist. <laughs> so that's how i would uh, put it Okay. Ravi, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 please, please, madam. Because yes, I know please. the real pain of uh, you know trying to do a PhD uh, when you're actually having a full-time job, right? So I think uh, our friend comes pretty much from that context. One thing I'd like to talk about is, as a research scholar, as much as you're dealing with uh, information overload, one of the critical aspects for you to work on how what are the search strings that you're using when you are searching? All right. one thing that i'm going to be strongly recommending and as a research guide today i use that you know look at the top scopus indexed journals so you have those categories right a b c d you understand what are those a b c d category journals in your domain so when you are actually searching on google scholar 
or when you're trying to search on your app score any of your knowledge gateways try and connect your search query to include one of these journal names to a very large extent you can deal with an information you know you can manage your information so much better there or let's assume you are looking at scenario number 2 where you are dealing with a scenario where this huge paucity of data that is available so you can't afford to do something like this one would be typically look at only those sources as what nilash said which is typically either credited to an author which is not uh, you know one of those paid and published kind of a sources so there are a lot of sources which take money from you and then publish that you can be visible online so that is something that you need to be very clear about second aspect if you come from a business and management or a technology vertical look up to some of these really large corporates like the gartners or the foresters or the mckinseys of the world which are equally powerful sources there are lots of cross references available here and use that to you know do your research don't go and do a google search if you are a serious researcher because what it will really lead you to is this you know garbage in garbage out kind of a scenario i have been a victim of it for 2 years so i hope that helps thank you. thank you and i think uh, we'll end with our last question uh, mr maha Namaste, oh, Swami K N from Sahyadri Arts College. So he's asking how digital media can reach a rural area, or how can people residing in a rural area can share their problems, or how can they communicate using social media? Is it possible? Uh, anyone? Sorry. No, that's a that's a great 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 question. Uh, sorry, Nikesh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, so i think that's a great question again it's it's a more fundamental question of access um i think a lot of companies uh, including google and there are other companies in this space also which is which is trying to uh, do a good job of providing access at quite affordable rates and what i hear uh, you know the the data rates in india are among the lowest in the world and uh, there are there are uh, success stories which you see you know uh, again i i don't exactly remember the name of this lady but in telangana uh, in a in a remote village i think some 80 or 100 kilometers from hyderabad uh, forget you uh, know forgive me if i'm getting the facts wrong but this lady who stays about 100 kilometers from hyderabad she has her own own channel on on youtube and uh, she she has become extremely popular similarly there are other other uh, people who are doing cookery shows showing uh, showing village cuisine to the rest of the world so net net i think uh, access uh, you know, you know uh, basic access is key uh, you know smartphone i'm sure a lot of companies are trying to give uh folks smartphone access at a very uh, affordable rates so one once there is access to technology once there is affordability i think we don't need to teach people people will figure it out uh, we we don't have to uh, perhaps digital literacy and regular literacy are connected but maybe disconnected at some level that if if we give access to technology to people who may not read write or you know uh, in that sense of the term but they can still go ahead and create magic we have seen those examples uh, so yes those basic uh, things have to be taken care of which is like the access part and the affordability part thank you thank you so much nurses dr smita do you want to comment yeah i think i'll just say one thing i think the world today is recognized two things that uh, you know as much as uh, english is a great language for business communication there's a huge shift towards the vernacularization of the web so why should a farmer sitting in gujarat necessarily know english to access the web the web is as democratic as it can get right so i think one huge and i think google has been heralding this scenario as to why should there be uh, over importance for a particular language dominating so one is the work, vernacular web will make things very very different the second aspect is this huge shift from text to voice so the voice is not just the privilege of an alexa user and let's look at it in india india is still largely a 2g country right as much as we like to talk 4g and 5g 
Now, some of the largest brands have realized this. I'm going to be sharing a, a, a link maybe that Professor Raviraj can be sharing with the audience posters, where Unilever has done some amazing campaigns with media dark places like Bihar, right? Where there's no electricity to even watch television. And then what am I going to be looking at, you know, connecting them on social media? So voice-based um, touch points would be very, very powerful. Gone are the days where you need to have great content in terms of just text, but voice is going to change the game, right? So I hope that will make things far more accessible. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we have already uh, overshot our time by 15, 20 minutes. Uh, thank you all the panelists, uh, Mr. Nikesh Ghosh, uh, Dr. Smita, and Mr. Nilashish for, uh, you know, uh, taking your time of your busy schedule and uh, helping our uh, faculty members and students to understand uh, the recent uh, trends in social media and digital media marketing and using these concepts in uh, professional growth and as well as institutional growth. Thank you so much, all of you. I also thank uh, Dr. Harsha and uh, Dr. Sadhana uh, for their support. Uh, thank you. Thank you one and all.